I'm not going to give you a lot of difficult calculations. I'm also not going to give you an overview of everything else that still has to be said. I know you're tired, but I'm a theorist, and so if I entertain you, I have to entertain you with theory. <laughs> um, <coughs> now, you have heard everything in Shankar's talk and in Leo's talk, so I just want to remind you of the things that you already know, so that you have the ingredients together to go through the little bit of theory I, I want to present. And what I need is that um, if we have a wire, a spinless P-wave superconducting wire, then at the two ends there are Majorana bound states. And theoretically, we describe such a wire using the Bukoyev of the Gen equation, which is an equation with a Hamiltonian, like a Schrodinger equation, but it has a two component grading for particles and holes. On the diagonal, you have your normal Hamiltonian, which is p squared over 2m for the, for the particles, minus p squared over 2m for the holes, and the off-diagonal part is, is your superconducting order parameter, which in a p-wave superconductor is, is proportional to, to the momentum p. You can also see that this is spinless, yeah, there is no Pauli matrices in here, this is just electrons and holes. And then um, the Majorana state, if it is there, is an excitation for which the creation operator is equal to the annihilation operator, and such an excitation happens at zero energy. So the situation you have is a spectrum where all the levels appear in pairs, except for one level, or as Shankar explained, except for two levels, which are spatially separated, which happen to be at zero energy. And so this is the one that, that we are interested in. Now, I will be mainly talking about this Hamiltonian, the spinless P-wave Hamiltonian, um, for the simple reason that it is the effective Hamiltonian that describes the spinless P-wave superconductor. Um, but in practice, um, as you've also heard, you can use or, you, or you, you can arrive at the spinless P-wave superconductor from more realistic models like a semiconducting wire um, in the presence of a large magnetic field. And so that was this Hamiltonian, which you have also seen. And so you've seen it if you... This, this is for a... Hamiltonian of, of a semiconductor in the magnetic field with, with proximity superconducting. And you have, or, or I hope you, you remember that if you go through a number of steps, so you, you, you apply the field to, to spin polarize it, you, you apply the spin orbit coupling to slightly tilt your, uh, your, 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 your spins away from, from perfect polarization, and then you remove your minority band, you induce superconductivity, that what you end up with is precisely this spinless P wave superconducting, which has this Hamiltonian. Now, not all of my of, of what I will be saying will be about a purely, perfectly one-dimensional spinless P-wave superconductor. I will also be talking about a quasi-one-dimensional spinless P-wave superconducting wire. That's a wire which has more than one transverse channel. And there, there is one subtlety that I, I think I should say, because otherwise you may have difficulty connecting to the, to the experiment. Um, so you can map this semiconductor to a um, spinless P-wave model. If you do, do this in two dimensions, you map it typically to a what's called a P plus IP model. It has an order parameter which is uh, Px plus I times Py. However, what is important is that you have to project only onto the spinless transverse channels. And what this means is, I think, best illustrated in an example where I've shown um, the, the dispersions for three transverse channels, there is a Zeeman splitting so that the spin-up channel, the majority channel, has a lower energy than the spin-down channel. But if you look at it, the lowest transverse channel, both spin-up and spin-down, are below the Fermi level. So this is not a spinless channel, this is a spin-full channel, and it won't give you a spinless P-wave superconductor. It's only, so only the channels which are such that the, the majority part is below the Fermi level, but the bottom of the minority part is above the Fermi level. Those channels are only truly spinless, and so only those channels give you a spinless P-wave superconductor. And so in this example, even though you have three transverse modes in your semiconducting wire, you only would have two transverse modes in your spinless P-wave superconductor. And if you ask me afterwards, or I, I will tell you now, for the experiments, we don't believe that the Zeeman splitting is so big that you have more than one transverse channel. But there are other scenarios in which you can realize spinless PWF superconductors, and there you may e more easily get into this multi-channel um, regime. Okay, so what are the questions that I want to talk about? Um, well, you've heard Leo Kauenhoven talk about ingredients and recipes. So experimentally, this is about cooking, and I want to check whether you are a clean cook. And my question is actually not whether you passed the, the, the test. I want to know whether if you have the dirt in your kitchen, 
whether you live or die. So the only question I want to talk about is, the, do the Majorana fermions survive this order? And I first want to answer this question in a one-dimensional spinless p-wave superconductor, and then I want to answer the same question in a quasi-one-dimensional spinless superconductor, so in a multi-channel spinless superconducting wire. And that's all. Um, all the other details, I think, don't fit into the time that is left. So here we are. This is our one-dimensional spinless p-wave superconducting wire. And as I said, we know in the end we have our Majorana bound states. These are localized states, and the localization length is the superconducting coherence length, which I call Xi, so it's H bar VF divided by the superconducting gap in the spinless PWF superconductor. And now the question that I want to answer is, what if I add to this Hamiltonian a disorder potential, and I add the same disorder potential that you always add if you look at semiconducting systems, it's a Gaussian white noise potential, so zero mean and a variance which is proportional to one over the mean free path. Okay, so what do we know about a disordered potential? And I want to first answer that question for a disordered normal metal without superconductivity. And I want to ask the question, if I have a wave function and I know it at the end of the wire, what happens to it if you go into the wire? You know disorder, Anderson localizes your, your electrons, and so you expect that your wave function goes down exponentially. Well, that's not true. It goes up exponentially. And why is that? Well, most likely your wave function will be localized somewhere in the bulk of the wire. And so if you are at the end, you're in the tail, and so your wave function goes up. Yeah, so if you have disorder and we have a normal metal, your wave function increases exponentially if you go into the wire. Well, combine this with what we knew about the spinless PF superconductor, where we knew that it decayed exponentially if you go into the wire. If you combine this, and the answer is as simple as it, as it is, of course you have to calculate, but the answer is, um, you have to just combine the exponential decay with the exponential increase. And so you see, if this order is weak, the decay wins. You still have a well-defined Majorana. If this order is strong, the increase wins. You don't have a well-defined Majorana. And you can also see what happens or where is the critical disorder, namely precisely if the, if the exponential decay is gone. Then the wave function of the Majoranas don't decay anymore. The left Majorana talks to the right Majorana and if we have two Majoranas, there's nothing that prevents them from splitting and going to finite energies. So we see that the topological phase persists only if your disorder is weak enough, and we know precisely how, how weak the disorder has to be. Um, okay. Now let's see what happens if we have more than one channel. So if you are a semiconductor person, this is mainly a theoretical question, but for the other proposals, this is actually a, a very relevant question. Um, so then we have this P plus IP model, um, and I first want to understand this PI plus IP model without disorder, um, because it's a bit less trivial than it seems. Um, first, I want to argue that I can get rid of the PY term. Why is that? Well, if I have a weak induced superconductivity, the coherence length is much bigger than the width of the wire. Your electrons or your holes will still make it a finite distance inside. All the time they will bounce off the top and bottom surfaces. Their momentum in the y direction will average out to zero, so p y is zero on the on the average, and that term will be small. So let's leave it out. If you leave it out, this Hamiltonian actually has an extra symmetry. It's called a, a chiral symmetry. In the Pauli matrix language, you see that it anti-commutes with sigma y, and that anti-commutation with sigma y for the theorists among you gives you the property that there can, if you have n channels, in principle be n Majoranas, so one for each channel and one at each end. So there will be n Majorana bound states, but that was of course without this PY term. If you now treat your term that I left out in perturbation theory, you will find that your n Majoranas at the end will split again. If you have an odd number, one of them will, will remain. If you have an even number, nothing is, is, is left. So what you will see at the end, there will be these n levels, one of them at zero if you have an odd number, or zero if you have an even number, and the other ones will, will stay, stay close to, the, to, the, to, to zero energy. And here you can see a numerical plot, which I think makes the point very nicely. Um, if you increase the width, you increase your channel numbers. If you have one channel, you have one Majorana. If you have two channels, you have no Majorana, but your fermion still stays at low energy because it's only split by a very small amount, and so there's more and more coming, but only for odd numbers of channels do you have a Majorana. Yeah, so then, what happens to this scenario if you add disorder? 
And um, so we have the same Hamiltonian now, the P plus IP model, with, again, a random potential in there, which is Gaussian white noise. And before te telling you how we get to this answer, I would like to tell you what the, the result is, because I think it's actually very fascinating. If you, in this model, add this order, you'll find that for n channels, you have a series of n topological phase transitions, meaning that n times you go from a system with Majorana to without Majorana to with Majorana to, to without Majorana. And in the kitchen anal analogy, this means that if you are a very clean cook, you're fine. If you add a little bit of dirt into your kitchen, they will come and tell you to close your restaurant. But if you add more dirt, you're, op you're allowed to, op to operate again. Yeah, that, that, that is, I think it's very counterintuitive, and so I would like to tell you where, where this story comes from. Um, and again, it's a calculation which on the hand-waving level um, we can do, I think, even um, at the late afternoon after a walk to the city center. Um, let's again throw out this um, delta y term, and so then at each end, if, if we don't have this order, I just convinced we have n Majorana states, um, and so there will be n of these wave functions which decay into the wire, and the decay length is the coherence length. Now, I want again to remind you what happens if we have n no superconductivity but just a normal metal, and this is an old problem in, in, in the physics of NSN localization or disordered semiconductors or, or whatever. For n channels, we know that we can find a basis such that the wave function has n different rates of increase. The fastest rate, fastest rate of increase is more or less with one over the mean free path. And the slowest rate of increase is with one over the local is with the localization length, with number of channels divided, or one over number of channels times mean free path. And so there are n different rates of increase. Um, well, if you don't know this, at least you hope I hopefully believe me that this is not something which is something that we had to find out for the Majoranas. This was an old problem in the physics of disordered systems. And so you combine this result with um, the statement that with Majoranas, all your wave functions decay. And so you find that, again, you have this competition between the decay from the superconductivity plus an increase from the disorder. Where now for n channels, we have a basis such that there are, that there are n different rates of, of increase. And now you can see what happens if you increase your disorder strength one by one, you're going to kick out all your Majoranas because they have a longer and longer localization length. At one point, the Majoranas, which has the fastest exponential increase coming from the disorder, will see its neighbor at the other end, and so they will disappear. And then n minus 1 will be left, and then n minus 2, and so on, until you have no Majoranas left. So the number of Majorana n states goes down from n to 0 stepwise if you increase the, the disorder strength. But it was still in the model without the delta y. In the full P plus IP model, I have to switch on this coupling. Um, and what that does is that whenever you have an even number of Majoranas, it gets rid of them. And if you have an odd number of Majoranas, it keeps one. And so if we went from n to n minus 1 to n minus 2 to n minus 3 and so on, with your full P plus IP model, so where you only talk about yes Majorana or no Majorana, you go from Majorana to no Majorana to Majorana to no, no Majorana and so on. Now, the theory I gave you was for delta y is zero. Here, we, you can show a numerical calculation. The horizontal axis is delta y is zero, so that's where the argument that I gave you works. Um, but you also see that uh, delta y really has n nothing to, to change. And the reason is, as before, that your, your, your electrons or your holes bounce from the, two, from the upper and lower side. P y on the average is zero. Yeah, this, this term is only a very small perturbation. The chiral symmetry is pretty good. And here you can see another simulation at very strong disorder where the assumptions that are, are not even, uh, even, even, even supposed to work, but, it's, but they still work. Okay, um, Mr. Chairman, am I on time? Okay, so then we stop. Um, I showed you that Majorana fermions can survive in the presence of weak enough disorder which is good news for the experiments. So if they don't cook that cleanly, you will still see something. Um, and the other thing, um, which I think for now is, is more theorists uh, fancy, but I think it's a very fascinating story, that if you have a multi-channel or a quasi-one-dimensional Majorana wire, um, then um, you have a transition between systems with and without Majorana bound states by increasing the disorder, and so you have re-entrant topological phases. So disorder sometimes can be good for your Majoranas. It doesn't always have to be bad. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.
So please ask questions or make comments. There is one. It's a question about the magnitude of the disorder. I mean, if I want to, I mean, another way to see it would be, uh, I expect that disorder will broaden the, the 1D uh, levels. And if this broadening becomes comparable to the level spacing, I mean, it's apparently the, the case in Moti Bloom's experiment, I mean, would Mariona still survive? What I mean do you mean by this sort of broadens the levels? If it's, it's, sorry, I'm talking about elastic scattering, so there is no broadening. Um, this order has a mean-free path, and so the relevant quantity to compare is the mean-free path from the disorder with your other relevant length scales, and for the Majoranas, that's the, the coherence length. Okay, so there is no mixing of uh, 1D, 1D channels, for you, 1D levels by this disorder. I would mean this order could mix the 1D channels. Oh, yes. Yeah, but there I is there mixing of the 1D channels, or how strong is it? Um, it's, it's, it's the mean free path which, which, which describes that, that mixing. If you have a point scatterer, then it also mixes the transverse channels. Are there questions or comments? Uh, could you please comment uh, why considering disorder, you assume uh, that center of localization uh, is uh, located uh, uh, somewhere far away on the right? You mean when I argue that my wave yeah, function yeah, why increases? Why write just exponent of x and uh, not ah. at, uh, the uh, random point? Okay, at so some point. as a theorist, unlike the experimentalists here, I'm looking at an infinite wire because only then do I have strict Majorana fermions. And if I have an infinite wire, the center of localization is always to the right. <laughs> because the only thing that I care about is how does it compare to the, to the Majorana fermion. Now, I can also give you the more fancy argument, which is that you have, what you have to look at is the transfer matrix of the wire. The transfer matrix has two eigenvalues, one of them that ex increases exponentially, the other one that decreases exponentially. The one that increases exponentially is the dominant one, and so that's one, one that you care about. Okay, one more maybe. So what about <coughs> the role of interactions, electron electron interactions in this problem? I mean. I think in all the experiments that we have heard, uh, I don't think we can uh, rule out interactions in the system since we're always talking about relatively small conductances. Yeah. So can you comment on that? Yeah, so my comment on the role of interactions is that um, they are, um, so you can ask what, what, what is the, the stability of the topological phase to interactions and the answer is it's stable. So weak interactions doesn't do anything to your topological phase. Um, so also for interacting systems, you can classify your topological phases. And this Z2 phase, so the phase which has yes or no Majorana, is a phase which whose classification persists in the presence of interactions. Now, of course, if you have very strong interactions, they may qualitatively change the features of your system and drive you away from the topological phase, just like very strong disorder drives you out of the topological phase. But the topological phase with the Majorana fermion is stable to weak disorder and weak interactions. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.